Welcome everyone. Good evening. I'm Fred Davis. I'm the chair of Medfield Energy Committee and I call the meeting to order and I welcome everyone on this very cold night. Medfield Energy Committee is fortunate to have an awesome array of 14 members who volunteer a very significant amount of time for the town. Tonight you'll be hearing an exciting preview of Medfield's Climate Action Plan. It's been organized over the past year by Dr. Hilly Passis, who's led an impressive team effort. Your presenters tonight have a lot of experience behind them. Collectively, they bring over 140 years of background in the energy and climate fields. What you will hear tonight may seem new, but I assure you a very solid consensus has emerged in Massachusetts and is now well established as the essential pathway for climate action going forward. We certainly look forward to your feedback. Even more, I look forward to all Medfielders cooperating and collaborating to implement this plan in 2022 and beyond. Thank you for all you've done, Hilly. Take it away. Well, thank you, Fred. Before I get started, I would like to thank the many people who have contributed to this work, especially the volunteers from the Energy Committee and from the community. Members of the town administration who have supported this work and the many regional professionals, experts and volunteers from other Massachusetts towns who have shared their insights and ideas and have encouraged us. Thank you also to the Medfielders who have already engaged with us in, in various ways. Um, could I have the first slide please? So this is a, a graph of um, NOAA map of the climate disasters in 2021. The climate emergency requires urgent action. This is an expensive uh, um, change in our environment. Uh, as you can see last year, only in this country, we had 20 climate related disasters that caused a total of over $145 billion. Each of these events was over a billion dollars worth. These 20 events killed at least 688 people. 2021 was also the fourth warmest year on record. These disasters may seem far away, but they affect all of us. We pay for them insurance costs, infrastructure costs, loss of life and resources, damage to biodiversity and the ecosystem. On tw in September 2021, parts of the Northeast also experienced this significant climate anomaly as the rem remnants of Hurricane Ida brought unprecedented rainfall, strong tornadoes, and many fatalities. Make the next slide, please. <clears throat> the Northeast has been warming faster than global average, even if you, we, we don't think we feel it. But we have already seen an increased number of short-term droughts, forest fires, greater intensity of storms, and more pre precipitation leading to flooding in winter and spring. This trend is projected to accelerate. The Pentagon calls the climate crisis a national security risk, a threat multiplier with cascading effects that cause damage to infrastructure, food systems and security, adverse health effects, increased in infant born diseases, energy insecurity, lack of opportunity, displacement and migration. This is not a future any of us want to live in or want our children to live in. We here in Medfield really have a lot of shared values. We care about our community deeply, about our homes, our livelihoods, our families, and our children's futures. Two thirds of Americans never talk about climate change because it's uncomfortable and scary. And it's easier to push it away because one feels helpless. But when we talk about it, we can see that there's a different vision. Megan? Climate change is not only a crisis, but it is a huge opportunity. We believe, we here in the Energy Committee and many of us uh, that are activists, but also along many experts, that there is a different vision for a better future. We envision a future that is a, has abundant energy, resources to all, a stable economy, and better lives for everyone. There are solutions that are practical, viable, and attractive. This rational hope inspires to action. There's no one silver bullet, but plenty of silver buckshot and each and every one can pick up a piece and put it into action. So how exactly do we get from here to there? 
The good news is that the state has made a plan and more and more towns and residents in Massachusetts are making plans and taking actions. We are all in the middle of a huge technology change away from burning fossil fuels uh, for, our, for our energy needs to cleaner and more efficient technologies. And at this point, I think Fred wants to share some thoughts on technology change that is underway. So the climate emergency that we're in, that Hilly briefly described, demands that the adoption of new technology accelerates. What does this new technology look like? Here's an example, electric vehicles. Next time you need to buy a car, it needs to be an electric vehicle. Next. Heat pumps. Next time you need to made, do a major repair or replacement of your heating system, it needs to go to heat pumps. Now think as I show you these three pictures, there's only three, the electric vehicles, the heat pumps, and one more. Think, are these big scary changes? And if you look at these pictures, it's really hard to tell where the new technology is or what impact it might have. And one more photo. Next slide. Is photovoltaics. Can you, can you see my slides? Yes, you're good. Okay. Could you go to the uh, next one, please? Yes, I can't see my slides, so I'm going to just stop for one sec. I'm very sorry. Let's okay. start again. Um, Shall I keep talking while you're doing that? Yes. All right, take, however long it takes, Megan, don't worry. All right, so the, there are only the three technologies that are a major impact on carbon footprint. And I showed you the one, the electric vehicles, I showed you the second, heat pumps, and the third for households would be, and, and anyone who, who has a roof, any facility that has a roof, photovoltaics. So my, my point is, think, if for those in the audience, think for a second, are these, scary? Are they strange? Are they intimidating? Keep going, please. The good news is, Medfield, we have done this before. Because this was Medfield's predominant form of transportation. So when this came around, it was intimidating and scary. It was loud. It was noisy and smelly, scary. It went like 30 miles an hour. Can you believe it? For a sustained period. Um, it, what we, talk, we think of it as the internal combustion engine. If you, you may have heard the term um, infernal, what's that word? Infernal contraption. It was the infernal contraption. So that was a long time ago now, 1903. But the point is that was the Medfield's very first car and thanks to David Temple at the Historical Society for uh, digging up these pic these um, historical photos. Uh, but the point was that this was very, very different than the horsed carriage. Very different. Can you imagine? Okay, keep going, please. But even though it was so different and scary, an infernal contraption, look at what happened. So this is an S-shaped curve. This is the adoption curve of the new technology. In the first three decades of the last century, automobiles went from 0% adoption to almost to 60% adoption in less than 30 years. That's an incredible rate of adoption. Go ahead. And since then, other technologies, other new technologies have come on board many, many times. And we have lived through many of these ourselves, so depending, I don't want to presume anyone's age, but microwaves, VCRs, cell phones. Um, each of these at the lower end of the curve, the beginning of the S-shaped curve, there were very, very few people coming on board. And many, many people thought strange, new, scary. 
one good thing that people have noted is that the ramp, the acceleration of new technology has increased over many decades. And that is exactly what's needed at this point with the decarbonizing technologies that I mentioned. The adoption of new technology is under, go ahead, thank you, is underway today to electric cars, to heat pumps, to photovoltaics. And the transitions midfielders made over a century ago at first seemed strange to them, to horseless carriages and electric lights. I don't think these, these uh, changes we need to make today are so strange. We've done this before and we can do it again. That's the historical perspective. Now, to catch us up to where we are, next slide. This is the inverse of those S-shaped cur curves. We need uptake of the new technology so that our carbon footprint will come down. Where we are right now is that 2017, that's our latest information for the state and for the town. That's our town carbon footprint, 112,000 metric tons. And that is the town that's townwide residential, commercial, and municipal all together. And that's where we are. And also following out from there to 2030, 2040, 2050 are the levels, the interim limits set by the net zero 2050 legislation that was just passed statewide in March of this past year. But it is now law throughout the Commonwealth. You'll be seeing more representations, more iterations of the same information throughout the rest of the presentation. But the bottom line is that rapid de decarbonization is the only path to meeting the carbon limits that are set. Next, please. If you take that number and divide it by all medfielders, you come out with a, an average per person carbon footprint of 8.8 .8 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And if you see that's 29% higher than the statewide average. I'm finishing with this, the highlights of the last 13, the first 13 years of the Medfield Energy Committee, which was established in 2008. Uh, I don't expect ever, anyone to be reading through it all. Uh, but I do want to point out that Medfielders as a whole have been incredibly supportive of the initiatives that Energy Committee has brought over the years and it's been much appreciated and we want to continue to earn your support as the next years of transition will literally require everyone's participation with that i thank you and i turn the program back to hilly well thank you fred um so how do we get make a plan so that everyone can contribute and feel supported in the energy in, a, in the technology transition that we're in um, Last May, the Energy Committee proposed a uh, warrant, Article 22, that was uh, overwhelmingly adopted by the town that uh, supports the state, state uh, um, emission limits, the net zero goal of 2050, and establishes the Town of Medfield Climate Action Plan. So we are charged with writing this plan and the last eight months have been inc incredibly busy as you can see on this timeline where um, we have put together a work group. We have reached out to the town, to the residents, to regional experts. Um, we have uh, 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 thought about, you know, looked at other climate action plans and started writing our priority list. I don't want to go through all this. It's, it, it was very busy, and uh, we uh, are very proud to, uh, to be where we are right now. The first thing we did uh, was to establish where, we, where Medfield is. We created the, the inventory, the carbon inventory for Medfield, and you can see immediately that the biggest contributors to, the car, uh, to greenhouse gas emissions in Medfield private cars and private homes. Uh, overall, the building sector and transportation sector dwarf everything else like waste and uh, other sources of emissions. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so as we started thinking about the Climate Action Plan, we decided to focus on 
the areas that have the greatest impact, where alternative technologies are readily available and where we can access incentives and rebates to make those solutions affordable. Uh, in addition, when we reached out to the residents, it became clear that there was a very strong uh, desire, a demand that the town, as uh, the town buildings and the, the town fleet must lead by example. Um, even though the town uh, has only less than 5% contribution to the inventory, that was something that residents stressed over and over. Next slide, please. So this one is a conceptual graph of what uh, Fred showed earlier, where we need to go in the next 30 years. Um, we are starting at 100% and we're hoping to go down to 15% in 30 years. And there are different sectors that can contribute uh, to the greenhouse gas reductions. One is turning our energy supply into renewable energy. Uh, the buildings can become more efficient and use that green, uh, green ele electricity uh, to, to function. And the transportation sector uh, can also electrify, use that clean renewable el electricity, and hopefully we can also find alternatives to uh, cars. Next slide, please. So TomCap is a roadmap that is, is structured into six objectives. It proposes several high priority strategies and specific actions that we must take. Later tonight, you will hear the details of these actions, but TomCap is not a list of all the actions one can take. It focuses on the actions that make the biggest difference in the shortest period of time, because we're in a crisis situation and we need to act. Of course, we also want to measure our progress, so we will look at measures of success. And going forward, we will continue to refine the details that are needed for implementation of the plan, such as uh, champions for each, each action or strategy, partners, um, and cost and equity considerations. The measures in the TOMCAP uh, will set Medfield firmly on a path towards achieving the net zero greenhouse gas pollution limits by 2050. TOMCAP will need regular revisions to adjust for the changing economic, legal, social, scientific, and technological opportunities and challenges. As directed by the warrant article that established TOMCAP, the strategic goals align with the state emission limits that Mrs. Massachusetts con co uh, committed to and that um, Fred outlined earlier. Next slide, please. So what kinds of actions are we proposing in TOMCAP? In our four questionnaire that we just closed, um, we found that Medfielders really want to learn more about how they can take action and what they need to do. And also they're looking for support um, in their decision-making and in, in accessing um, resources. So overarching, the theme of our actions is to support residents um, by education and guidance, uh, sharing between residents, peer sharing, uh, finding information on grants, incentives, and rebates, and make sure that the infrastructure and governance structures uh, do not impede the implementation of the new technologies. Next slide, please. So here we are. Um, these are our priorities, uh, priority areas, and I would like to invite Penny Connor to talk about renewable energy in midfield. Thank you, Hilly. And thank you, Fred. Both of you have set the stage of how important it is for us to really address this climate crisis. And I'm thrilled to be a part of helping design the renewable energy approach to this. And it is wonderful to see that so many med builders already want to be part of the solution by adopting these new ideas, which are not scary, Fred. So really, when it comes to renewable energy, what we wanna be focused on is to produce more energy locally and to source the remaining energy via renewable resources. So we've addressed because as Hilly said, we don't have a lot of time. So we set some very aggressive goals. By 2030, we would have 100% of our municipal properties that are viable would have installed solar. 
that 100% of our power supply comes from renewable resources and that all of us as businesses and residences, where viable, 50% of us have invested in solar for our own energy production. And by 2050, we're totally maximizing our solar production. So I wanna explore a little bit about how we get to these goals. Really, there's very two clear goals. One, make electric supply renewable by 2030. And second, to produce more energy locally. Now, I hope that all of you, as you're listening to this, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We're going to interactively address these as we move forward and looking forward to uh, hearing your feedback on these opportunities. But with that, let me drive down a little bit more into the renewable section and talk about how can we source supply to make it more renewable. So one of the best ways to do that is the fact that Massachusetts restructured energy supply back in the late 90s. What that did for all of us as residents is it allowed us to procure our energy supply from competitive suppliers. This allowed many, many of our customers who have done this to reduce their energy costs or uh, secure energy that is more renewable. But it's a little bit of a challenge for each of us to individually figure out which competitive supplier is the right one. What we are proposing here is that Medfield have Medfield energy choice with municipal aggregation. 150 towns in Massachusetts are already have this or starting to do this. So we're very excited to be joining them. But what this means is that now you have really a buyer that is at your ready, the town of Medfield, who will source renewable supply or source energy supply that makes sense and is aligned with our goals. This would allow us as Medfielders to participate in Medfield community electricity. There'll be choices that we can choose from depending on our needs, but all of those choices are aligned with our climate action goals. So I'm real excited about Medfield moving forward with this community choice aggregation. Now, how will we be supporting that? Well, a lot of education and information, and we'll be doing that through things just like you're seeing tonight, through webinars or other tools that we have, or our sustainability website. And the town, we hope, will be modeling the way that they will secure whatever remaining electricity supply that they need through all renewable resources. And I say whatever remaining electricity supply they need because the second piece of our, our our process here is to produce more locally. And so let's move to the next slide and talk about how we're going to produce more locally. And it starts with our municipal properties. And this is wonderful news for us. This saves money for the town. The town invests in solar and we get the benefits for the next 25 years by reducing the cost of our supply needs. So this makes, this is a win-win-win for the town, for all of us as Medfield citizens. So how will we do this? Well, first we need to assess the solar potential on all of the properties that Medfield, the town of Medfield has. So we'll be doing that process to figure out where do we have the potential? What are viable properties? Then once we understand those, you heard Hilly say, we're gonna prioritize which are the most important and do them first. That's what we'll do. We'll develop a plan, get the big hitters first, put them into place and continue to work that plan going forward. And all along, we'll be bringing all of you as the community so that you're involved and engaged with our plans going forward for solar. And we're not going to stop there. We believe that solar partners very well with battery storage. So we look to combine the solar with battery storage so that we will have a supply, perhaps when the power goes out at some of our most important facilities, such as our public service buildings. But we need to do more. That's what the town will do. They're gonna model the way, they're gonna get there first, but all of us can invest in solar investments. And so let's talk about the next slide. What we're going to do is create a program for homeowners and businesses so that you can learn more about how to invest in renewables so that you can assess whether your property is viable to put solar on your roof. 
and then we'll work with information about how do you go about that process. So we look forward to working with all of you to invest in these clean energy solutions and these renewable solutions. So as I wrap it up here, I just want to remind all of us that we really have two goals in the renewable section. Produce more locally, invest in solar, put it on our roofs, put it on our municipal properties. And the second is what we're not producing locally, let's secure 100% renewables via our energy supply aggregation through our Medfield electric choice. So we look forward to working with all of you and moving forward on renewables. And with that, we will move now to buildings. Thank you. Great, Penny, thank you. That is really exciting plans that you have there. And that lays a really important foundation for reducing the carbon footprint uh, that Fred outlined before. Because typically electricity for things like your refrigerator, your lights, computers, TVs, is about 15 to 20% of the energy that a typical home uses. So just sign up for the uh, 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 Medfield Community Electricity. We'll have a you know, uh, uh, very high renewable option. And all of a sudden, a lot of your carbon has vanished. But obviously that won't be enough. And as you saw on the inventory chart that Hilly showed, um, buildings, uh, particularly our homes, are a very, very large part of the carbon footprint of the town. And in fact, if you add homes, the municipal buildings and the commercial buildings, uh, that accounts for 50% of the carbon footprint uh, in the town. So what we have to do is reduce the amount of energy that those buildings use. And as we build new buildings, make sure that those are using as little electricity or as little energy as possible. And then we need to replace the fossil fuels that the buildings do use now, particularly for heating, uh, and replace that with that renewable clean electricity that Penny was talking about a moment ago. So what we're gonna aim for in the next uh, eight years or so by 2030 is encourage uh, all residents and, and the businesses in town that as they're installing new heating and hot water equipment to go for that electric equipment, go for those heat pumps that Fred showed earlier. We're also going to uh, try to get all of the quote unquote high potential homes, a term I'll define in a minute, to install one or more energy efficiency measures so that they're reducing the energy they use. And by 2030, we aim to reduce the total fossil fuel usage in town by at least 50% so that we are aligned with the goals that the state has set. But then by 2050, we will continue that evolution, continue that change so that all buildings in Medfield are 100% electric and reach that uh, carbon goal that Fred outlined, which is 85% below where we are today. Let's go to the next slide. So in order to do that, we're going to break this up into two pieces. First is reducing energy use and greenhouse gas emissions of buildings, and then electrifying heating, cooling, and hot water generation. So let's go to the next slide, and we'll dig in a little bit about reducing the energy use of our buildings. So as I said, we're going to aim for 100% of high potential homes to have installed one or more energy efficiency measures. And the state uh, 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 decarbonization roadmap uh, says in this quote that small residential buildings, our homes, um, are relatively easy to modify and they're a big part of statewide building emissions. So we're gonna do a lot of education. I know there's a lot of new stuff, a lot of stuff to think about. So we're gonna have a lot of broad-based education like this. Um, for all residents of town so they can think about what works for their homes and certainly encourage them to get mass save assessments. Even if they've had one in the past, uh, the mass save program just launched a new set of incentives, very uh, uh, big overhaul to them. So there's probably new opportunities, even if you've had a mass save assessment in the past. But in addition to these broad based education efforts, we're going to do targeted outreach to these high potential homes. What do I mean by that? If you think about 
homes built in probably the 70s and before, energy wasn't that big a consideration in building. The building codes didn't really address it the way it is now and certainly began to be addressed in the 80s, 90s, and so on. So we're going to reach out to those homes, uh, make sure they understand the potential to lower their energy bills and, quite frankly, be more comfortable in their homes if they're able to do that. We'll also do targeted outreach to landlords and tenants. We think this is very important because um, about 17% of the housing units in the town are rental. Um, it's a little more challenging in rental properties to, uh, to install these measures. So we wanna make sure we reach out to them so that even renters get the benefits of, um, of these uh, uh, savings, comfort, and the lower carbon emissions. Next slide, please. And is, oh, nope, so go back one. Okay, go forward one. There, stop. <laughs> so um, we're gonna get our homes, our existing homes and, and things more energy efficient, but it's also, you know, it's much easier to make a new building very, very energy efficient than it is to take an older building and go back and try to fix it and make it energy efficient. So our next priority is to really make sure that as we plan and build new buildings in town, that they are built to a very high performance, energy performance standard, like the net zero energy standard. Uh, the Medfield Energy Committee has been working with the State Hospital Development Committee for about the last year and a half. Um, and uh, they've been wonderfully receptive to include uh, very high energy performance standards in the RFP and selected a uh, most advantageous developer who uh, was very aligned with that goal. So as that project moves forward, we'll continue to work with them to see that those standards get implemented and that that project becomes a real showcase for what's possible. Um, we'll continue. Uh, education, there'll be a strong component of our education program, reaching out not only to residents, but the builders who work in the town and the town departments, so that they understand the new techniques, the new building materials, and examples of where uh, new buildings reach, you know, uh, uh, energy usage, you know, 60% below what was standard a couple of years ago, even. Um, and then the state is currently developing a next generation building code called the net zero stretch code. Um, it's expected to be published this year. And when it is, we will begin the process of having the town adopt it. And we aim to have the town adopt that within two years. So then once that code is in place, once that is the build building code, all new buildings will be very, very energy efficient, very low carbon, and that'll be a very important contribution um, to these goals. Next slide, please. So we've reduced the energy used in these buildings, but we have not dealt with the energy that they currently use. And this is where we go back to that other project about electrifying heating, cooling, hot water generation. Installing those heat pumps that Fred showed in the place of the um, uh, uh, gas furnaces and oil boilers that are standard right now. Here again, our priorities are going to be first residential buildings, our homes, uh, apartments that are rented, condos in town, things like that, because again, they're the biggest carbon footprint. So let's go after that. The municipal and school buildings, uh, we've worked with the town since the beginning of the energy committee and found a number of opportunities to improve their energy efficiency and to uh, uh, fix things. Uh, we'll continue to do that and take it to the next level, to plan ahead for when those systems need to be upgraded or replaced so that we can plan to get those to electric. And then finally, the commercial sector, not an area we've done a lot of work in on the Energy Committee yet. As you saw, about 14% of the town uh, building emissions. Um, but uh, so an area we need to do some work in, find out what are those commercial buildings, find out which are the biggest ones, and then go after 
uh, the energy savings and then the electrification in those buildings as well. So when we get all these projects in place, when we start to uh, implement all of this, we'll have these nice energy efficient, warm, low carbon emission homes. But we've still got to get back and forth to our workplaces, go out and run errands and things. So we need to make sure our transportation is efficient, low carbon, and clean too. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim Redden, who will outline our plans for that. And if I may just interrupt here, sorry, Jim. Um, I just want to reiterate again, if you want to have a comment, please put it in the Q&A and we will address that in due time. Thank you. Jim Redden, take it away. Okay, good evening. My name, as they've been saying, is Jim Redden, and I'm gonna give a quick overview of the transportation section of our climate action plan. Transportation in the climate action plan covers two things. Vehicles, as you saw, um, are the largest emitter of carbon in town, passenger vehicles, 42%. So we are clearly gonna be focused on those. And passenger vehicles means local cars, pickup trucks, things like that. And then the other part of our vehicle transportation is local, what we call low carbon mobility. And this is basically bikes and people powered vehicles, ride sharing and carpooling. So we have two pieces to this, um, low carbon and electric vehicles. Vehicles are a very critical part of the climate action plan. The passenger vehicles make up this highest percentage of emissions and they're controllable over time. Vehicle technology is changing rapidly, so staying in form will be critical to making good choices. If there isn't an electric car for you right now, it won't be long before there is one you like. Vehicles are, consum are consumable goods, so they break down and they wear out. Each time there's a major vehicle repair or expenditure, you should consider the EV option. These are what we call natural transition points. Vehicles will be wearing out every few years, every multiple years. And when you have a large expenditure or potentially looking at a new car, that's the time to look closely at the EVs. Most people will be surprised at how cost-effective and practical an, EV, an electric vehicle can be. So we can control the emissions, but they're gonna be controllable over time as we buy electric vehicles. The only thing better than electric vehicles are people powered vehicles that use zero fuel. Biking, both pedal, powered and electric bikes, which do have a battery, are very good alternatives for certain uses. We encourage safe biking through both education and building bike paths and access to lanes. Medfield has started moving forward in this through the town plan and has made other efforts we'll discuss henceforth. Medfield is a community that does not have a lot of mass, transport, mass transit options and there are, because there are a lot of commuters. Um, we encourage carpooling and other ride sharing. So to summarize, the objectives. The long-term goal is to have residents and town, town personal vehicles driving electric vehicles all the time. The town will have ample public and private parking, ample public and private charging infrastructure. Objective two is the goal is to have bike paths and people powered alternate trans, uh, transportation, bike paths and bike parking and other infrastructure that is needed to increase uh, bike usage. Next slide, please. So how are we gonna first go over the electric vehicle uh, strategies? And the primary and first one is to encourage all Medfield residents, if possible, to drive an electric vehicle. The advances in EVs are kind of astounding. Today, there are multiple manufacturers, Tesla, GM, Ford, many startups, all of them have great vehicles that are out there and have been proven in the marketplace. There are all types of vehicles available. Cars, large, small, vans, trucks, pretty much everything is being electrified and is coming to market very quickly. Prices have started to come down dramatically and cover a vast range. Basically, you can buy an electric car somewhere from around $30,000 to 150 dollars on up. Another big issue with electric cars is their range. Nowadays, most electric cars go over 200 miles per charge, even 300 for most of the for most others. And there's the prototype out from Tesla that's good, doing 600 mile, 800 miles on a single charge. So the range, um, the range is going up quickly and should be no problem in the future. These electric cars also have almost no maintenance, so they're low cost to drive. Nationwide, there is 
a limited, there's charging all across the nation right now, but it is still part of the infrastructure that's needed to make these electric cars fully useful everywhere. EVs also have the lowest fuel cost per mile, about one to two cents per mile compared to 10 to 20 cents for a gas engine. Electric engines require lowest maintenance and they have astounding torque, which means they're very fast. So we have identified some of the specific actions to move forward uh, and to encourage adoption. One of the most important actions is the engaging with education and informing the public, as others have been saying tonight, uh, the Energy Committee, along with Sustainable Medfield, has websites and information available on these topics. Um, you can go to Sustainable Medfield website for resources and information on how to make informed changes and how to reduce your carbon footprint. Another outreach type program we're working on is uh, getting support from the local papers. We put um, articles or the Midfield Committee is uh, authoring small paragraph articles that go into the uh, Hometown Weekly each week uh, concerning some carbon reducing issue. Um, we also have a peer-to-peer -peer group. Any of a lot of the electric vehicle owners, Fred being one of them, will be happy to talk to other people in town and love talking about their cars and giving information about how they work, what to expect, and all the kind of information that makes people more comfortable with electric cars. Um, there are also two specific uh, events that we're going to sponsor. The Medfield Day, we had an electric car there last Medfield Day, and that was well received. And a lot of people got to see it. And we're planning an EV car show in the spring, probably at Hospital Hill. Next slide, please. I'm going to go through this a little quicker as we're going. But Medfield has always been a town that leads by example. As a green community, community municipal vehicle selection and purchasing for the last few years has been following a practice a process that maximizes efficiency and minimizes total operating costs. This process includes review of electric vehicles. Um, so the fire police department, uh, DPW, they've all been looking at uh, both electric vehicles, hybrids, and are working them into their capital plans. Um, some of the specific things that are of most interest on the public side or the municipal side is police cars. Um, Tesla has a new police car that is getting really good reviews goes very fast. Um, it needs quick charging, but it's a chase car. There's also a hybrid Ford um, SUV that a lot of police uh, um, departments have been looking at because the hybrid goes to electric battery when they're idling. And as the police know that they, police cars spend a lot of time idling and using up a lot of emissions just sitting there. So a hybrid is a particularly good application for that. And then I think everybody would say, everybody's talking about the Ford truck, the 150 truck. Uh, most DPWs are definitely thinking about a Ford Lightning and when and how they might want to get in line for one of those. So the, uh, the community has been, the, the town itself has been uh, very forward thinking in how they're looking at electric vehicles. They've also applied under the green communities for grant this year. So we have some money coming for potential either electric vehicle or charging stations. Um, and then before moving on to this one, I did want to mention one thing that has, that seems to have a lot of interest in town. Uh, school buses, um, our interest, obviously, because our kids are there and they are big emitters of, of emissions. Um, we, we understand that the town does not own the school buses at this point and that, that parking in town has also been a long term problem. So we still want to work with the, the town to try to find out what might be available for electrifying school buses. There are many new grant programs coming out and there may be, a, there may be ways to move forward um, on that topic. And there's a lot of interest in it. Next slide, please. Uh, quickly, in order to do electric vehicles in town, we're going to have to install town charging infrastructure. So um, infrastructure is the charging stations that are required around town. There'd be both private and public infrastructure required. Um, charge in, there's a lot of different types of charging. Level one and two charging is done at home. Uh, level two and three can be done in public. Um, and basically the town needs to look at all the different public and private places and come up with a plan as to where the best charging stations should be. There has been some of that going on and we're gonna continue working on that. Um, basically public stations might be at schools, parks and town hall and things like that. Uh, next slide, please. I just wanna keep moving. So now I'm gonna shift from vehicles um, from to the, uh, what I call people powered infrastructure. And our first uh, objective is this, uh, bike pass, expanding bike pass and walking infrastructure in town. Um, the town master plan support has been supporting better bike access and expanded bikeways. 
as you can see in this picture, the town has already started identifying bike lanes and marking some of the roads. This is a very good start to making biking more accessible to more people and safer. I also think a highlight or an issue that has to be dealt with over the next few years is electric bikes and scooters are growing in popularity. Um, this is a great thing for uh, low carbon use, but it, there will probably need to be regulations to make sure that they are done safely and effectively for everybody. Uh, next slide, please. And our final part of, the, of, of transportation is how to increase and develop more in, infrastructure that supports public transit. Um, there are local groups uh, like the uh, Council on Aging that has vans that uh, help move people around town. There's also ride sharing available, but there really needs to be uh, more work on public transit in, in Medfield. Um, and we're working on that as part of our uh, initiatives. So I hope that helps you understand a little bit about the transportation initiatives. And I'm gonna turn it back to Hillier Fred for the next stage. Well, thank you, uh, everyone. That was uh, a very nice in-depth look at uh, the actions and priorities that we have. Um, here's a summary slide of the six priority objectives uh, that we want to pursue in midfield. And um, what are the next steps really where Tom Cap is, is going? Megan, can you give me the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so from here on after tonight, uh, we will continue to reach out to the community and to the town to get uh, feedback and comments on the plan. Uh, there's gonna be a public comment period in February and we're looking at publishing our, our report in March. And we want to make sure that everybody understands that this plan is going to be an evergreen plan. This is not a one-off, we write it and we put a, our, an archive on the town website. We want to regularly make sure that it, in, it evolves, it gets refined and it's updated. Um, we want to continue to look for grant opportunities support, to support our efforts and to make, to make sure that the town incorporates climate considerations in the planning and budget processes going forward. A huge part, as you could hear throughout this talk, is our engagement with the public. We want uh, to make sure everybody has access to the information and the support that uh, we can offer. And we're very, very glad that we have already strong community support and a wonderful uh, set of wonderful community groups that we can partner with um, uh, that offer information and uh, access to resources such as sustainablemidfield.org. Um, next slide. Oh, actually, I, I want to make sure that so overall, this plan is an excellent start and implementation will substantially reduce the greenhouse gas pollution that emanates from midfield. It will build valuable knowledge and expertise and will help build public support for the new actions that can be introduced in the future updates of the net zero plan. So before we uh, ask our, our listeners, uh, invite them for the discussion. And I also, I'm gonna read out some of the comments that have been coming in. I would like to invite Selectman Pete Peterson, who was a member of Tom Cap of our work group to make a few comments, please. Thanks, Hilly. Um, I'm learning Zoom slowly but surely. I've had the honor to work with the uh, truly dedicated uh, group of people on the uh, Medfield Energy Committee for the past 13 years. And our town is really blessed to have this, this group of people because they're uh, very knowledgeable about energy and climate issues. And they're also very willing to share their uh, time and their expertise with us and our town. The town saved a lot of money on, on its energy as a result of that. Um, and, and we're really, uh, they were the ones that really got the uh, planning for the net zero new elementary school uh, accepted uh, by the building committee. Um, and so our town has really greatly benefited and, and I'm learning a lot. I'm the, I'm the non-expert on the energy committee, um, but, and I just thank them for their uh, service and uh, sharing to, with the town. Thank you. Um, and I would also like to invite Sarah Raposa, our town planner, to say a few words.
I Christine, I think Sarah needs to be promoted, please. Hi, everybody. Thanks for such a great presentation tonight. Um, I just wanted to just underscore the important work that TomCap, uh, your committee is doing with the TomCap plan. It coalesces superbly with the work of the master plan, um, but also the municipal vulnerabilities plan and the hazard mitigation planning work that we've done in the past, as well as the work that the um, mul a multiple variety of departments and boards and commissions are also doing. A climate action plan was identified as one of the top 12 recommendations from the master planning process. Uh, so thank you for getting moving on implementation so quickly. So with any planning process, you have another planning process um, to endeavor to. Um, but getting down into the details as you have done is really important. The amount of education and outreach that your committee is doing is exceptional. It's really important. Um, and I just want to reflect on some of the uh, sustainability efforts that went into the master plan. Uh, I know that your committee has uh, was highly involved in the work of the master plan and it's really evident. Um, there's a great inventory uh, that was part of the existing conditions report that was presented in uh, June of 2020 and there's a six page summary sheet that calls out all of the sustainability factors um, over a variety of elements within the master plan, such as housing and population, economic development, natural resources, areas where you might not expect to find sustainability indicators, but you do. Um, and the last thought I wanted to leave you with um, the crossover with the master plan is that our consultants listened to the town uh, when uh, they said that sustainability is really important. And they actually developed a set of indicators for every single um, action item within the implementation plan um, that measure each strategy in terms of sustainability, such as environmental protection, health and wellness, regional cooperation, social and economic vitality, and future resilience. So the work is um, far and deep reaching. So happy to join you as you uh, continue your endeavor. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, you know, all these considerations have gone into our, our proposals too. Um, I don't think it it was stated clear enough that we do want to encourage economic viability or vitality in in Medfield, and many of the, the proposals have that as a co benefit. Um, that that sustainability, right, is a little bit of everything, and then that <laughs> finds the the sweet spot. Right. So at this point, um, I would like to. Uh, invite people to raise their hand if they want to, to speak or to put their questions and comments in the, in the Q&A. Uh, some people have already done that and we're gonna answer them live. And if you, for any, whatever reason, cannot uh, comment tonight, I would invite you to email us at tomcap at midfield.net and we will get back to you. And so, so Fred, if you could host the uh, question and answer, please. Let me see what I can do here, folks. And uh, before we get into them, I just want to uh, thank all the uh, panelists. Thank you so much for everything that you presented. And uh, I want to point out Megan, who's been uh, helping behind the scenes, and Helen Dewey, who's been helping behind, behind the scenes in addition. Thank you so much. So let me see what I can do here to uh, field these questions. I'll try to paraphrase and uh, assign to uh, the panelists as we go. So first one- Fred, Fred could is, I just interrupt yeah. you? I think it's, um, it's, uh, it's required for people to identify themselves. 
uh, because it's the official meeting. I, All right, so I'll, I'll invite as, as, as we go. So Lester uh, asks, and then I'll ask uh, Lester to speak up and give us his name. I'd like, to, he'd like to address the cost of replacing so, uh, someone's heating system with heat pumps. Now, you also ask Lester about the cost of battery backup units. They're generally seen as separate things, but I'm going to field this to Jim Nail as soon as Lester, if you don't mind, uh, how does Lester unmute himself here? <laughs> Isn't that an issue? I, I think you'd have to uh, type in the question and answer. Otherwise, we'd have to promote him if he wants to be promoted. Oh, OK, yes. Yeah, so could, Lester, Lester, you're invited, please, to put in your name. Did you say we need his address, too? No, just I think it's just a name. No, you need name and address, please. Okay. Thanks, Thank Christine, you. for clarifying that. And uh, Lester, are you still there? And would you please type in name and uh, full name and address? Should I skip down to the first full name person? Perhaps we can come back to Lester if you've if you're available. Um, Bob Winograd asks: Are there residential solar array leasing leasing options? which are zero cost to the resident. And how does that interact with a significant, and Penny, this is for you, how does that interact with a significantly reduced KWH rate? Good questions, Bob. Great questions, Bob. And so, yes, solar uh, folks who are considering installing solar can uh, choose to buy the panels and have them installed on the roof and they get the total benefit then of the panels or they can lease their roof and then they would get a rate that they would negotiate with the solar provider that would be a discount on their overall electric bill. So either option is viable. I just encourage folks to look at them eyes wide open. Uh, typically, if you own the panels, there's a little bit uh, richer benefit to it, uh, but uh, the idea of not having an upfront cost is also very attractive. And so for many folks, that makes the most sense. So I just encourage folks to look at it eyes wide open. Can only second that. I was just talking to somebody who had leased their roof uh, space a few years ago. And when they got their contract, um, their roof was already over five years old. And they insisted on writing writing into their contract that the lease included one change, uh, one removal and change of the roof, um, and that the, they were they covered that expense in the original contract. Something Great. very so, important to consider: the age of your roof that you're putting it on. Yes. Moving on to Teresa James, who likes the Solarize Medfield Initiative but is now asking, is there a special program, and this is gonna be for you, Jim Nail, yeah. is there a special program for heating and cooling systems where if multiple residents were adopting heat pumps, then there's cost savings for homeowners and a win for the energy objectives. And I think, Teresa, you're probably talking about separated uh, single family homes, but there's also another alternative interpretation of your question is if it's a multifamily home. So both questions are good. Yeah, um, the easy answer is yes, there is. The Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, which is the organization that runs the Solarize programs or facilitates them for and assists towns in running them, has what's called Solarize Plus, which is solar plus heat pump. So you can select a solar installer, you can select a heat pump installer, and you know similar kind of structure that the more, pe the more residents who buy those things uh, the lower the cost gets. Great. So I'm going to jump back to Lester, who's put in name and address. Thanks for, very much. And again, this question, Jim Nail, this is back to you again. Uh, he'd like to address the cost of replacing one's heating system with heat pumps yep. and also asking about battery backup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let me start. The, the state of Massachusetts is such a leader in all of these things in energy efficiency and solar and everything. Um, the new mass save incentives, which just came out uh, this month, um, will give you up to $10,000 to replace your existing fossil fuel heating system with heat pumps. If they're air source heat pumps, if they're geothermal, you can get up to $15,000. 
Um, so that really addresses a lot of that cost differential. Um, I personally, about two years ago, under the prior Mass Save program, um, replaced an air conditioning unit that had died um, and went to a heat pump and found that the Mass Save incentive pretty much covered the difference between just putting in a air conditioning only unit and heat pump. So it made, it was great. It was perfect sense to me, let's go heat pump. And now for a lot of the winter, um, I turn off my oil boiler uh, and just let the heat pump heat my house. Um, you yeah. also mentioned about federal support. Um, this is where the Build Back Better uh, Act that is currently being debated uh, in the Senate is really important. Uh, my understanding is that there used to be a federal tax incentive is only about $500 a year. So not huge, but hey, 500 bucks off the top of your tax bill, who's going to turn that down? Um, but I believe that's expired. And I believe a renewal of that will be in the Build Back Better bill. And probably I would suspect, you know, a higher uh, amount of incentives. So that'll be an important thing to watch. Great. Uh and, and these are great questions. And just uh, all of Medfield Energy Committees and MEAs uh, and Sustainable Medfield's programming have addressed uh, many of these areas and will continue to do so. So whatever doesn't get answered tonight, uh, stay tuned. <laughs> so let's go to the next. I, I, I did start back from the top. So now uh, Anonymous, is. it turns out, is Jeanette. So thanks, Jeanette, and uh, is asking, uh, I had a conversation with someone, and this is for you, Penny, who did not see the sense in getting solar panels for their home because they were already getting electricity from renewable sources. What's the response? So the benefit is it reduced your cost because if you put solar on the roof, it is using a convection called net metering. So you, your usage is first addressed by the solar panels on your roof. And then the remainder of it is handled through uh, your supply contract. So you will end up saving money with the solar panels. Typically, investment in solar panels has a payback of around seven years with the Massachusetts SMART program. Great. And, I'm going, and by, by the way, a payback of seven years is the equivalent of about a 10% interest rate. So if anybody can find CDs or federal you know, treasury bonds or anything that pay 10%, go ahead and do it. Otherwise, buy the solar. I'm going to uh, get through these uh, questions, um, but um, Bob Winograd, thank you so much for multiple questions. I'm going to uh, give everyone a chance to get at least one question answered first. And I see Lester at the end wants to address directly. That's great. So I'm going to continue with Tom Carl. Tom uh, says, uh, my wife and I own the 300 year, 300 plus year old house, um, installed a metal roof and 40 R, R value insulation in the roof with new insulation blown into the walls. About a year ago, we applied for a variance to install a two axis solar tracker in our backyard. It was denied. Uh oh. Do we have anything to say to this? Uh, who was, uh, so it probably begs questions about who did what denying. Uh, I can answer that. The ZBA denied the variance request for it. So I think the, um, the standards that you may have vary from the uh, dimensional requirements and the variant standards under um, state zoning. That's so I, your question was not to me. I was just giving you some factual um, <laughs> information on the, the um, on the actual application. Um, but the uh, I, I suppose the question is still quite valid. So and it was the it was the fact that it was a tracking system that made it outside. No, it, it was a violation of the front setback requirement where no structures um, can be placed in the front setback. Um, I think in his it was either thirty or fifty feet. So um, because of the shape of his lot, the in his particular structures not being able to support or um, have good solar access, this particular area was the uh, most ideal and advantageous spot for the tracker. So it wasn't the um, notion of the tracker that the ZBA uh, didn't care for, it was the particular location. It sounds tough. 
Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you so much for jumping in there, Sarah. That that's helpful for everybody to know. I don't think it's that helpful for Tom. Sorry, Tom. But I, I'd be glad to uh, pick it up with you if you'd like it at another time, Tom. And can, can I say one thing too? Uh, Tom, I want to do a case study about what you've done with your house because that's exactly what I was talking about before. Um, and I would love to hear what your before and after energy bills were and get you to tell other Medfield residents uh, that they should do the same thing. And I just want to throw in, you know, when we talked about governance um, and removing obstacles, um, this may not apply directly because it's it's sort of in a historic district and everything, but that's the kind of thing where we want to look at potential obstacles to installing the modern technologies, the, the cleaner technology, um, where you know zoning or or bylaws or other rules uh, could be modified without huge impact, but still make a big difference for the new technology. I think I'm getting through at least one question per person now at the bottom, uh, Sam Reese, right? Sam didn't ask before. Okay, so Sam, I'm jumping to your question, uh, which is what are the best options for residents if their roofs are not viable for solar? Uh, so I'm gonna give a, a generic, uh, insert a generic and then let anybody on the panel address this. Uh, you know, the specifics are of course important, what's not viable about the roof, but um, as a generic uh, piece of information, I, I would just like to say if people haven't uh, checked whether they have a viable solar opportunity, if they haven't checked in the last year or two, check again, because pricing for solar changes, technology, the, the efficiency improves, um, and it's always good to check again. Uh, the the motto a couple, a, even a year or two ago was, if folks think they're they're not they're, they don't have a cost effective solar opportunity, that's because they haven't checked in the last six months. So that's a generic. Doesn't mean it applies to you, Sam. Uh, does anybody have any other hmm. uh, responses that might apply for Sam? I, I just quickly jumped onto Google uh, satellite to look at that roof, and that looks like a pretty darn good roof. It's a nice orientation. Doesn't look like a lot of shade. Um, All I right. Would, uh, I would try to go for it. With that, I think I'll, I'll ask Lester if he can be promoted. Is that possible? Because he asked to address. And I think that what Jim just did there was invite Sam to speak up if he'd like <laughs> also. Um, so here, Lester, thank you very much for being here. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, um, by the way, I think this in general is a very good presentation. I'm all for solar. Um, we put solar on a house uh, four and a half years ago. And every year we actually generate more solar than we need. Um, but a, a few things I think are very, very important to, to point out. Um, when presentations like this are, are made, we should really be sure of the facts that are being presented. For example, I believe someone made a comment that the cost for electric cars per mile is one to two cents per mile. That, that is incorrect. Today, you get approximately three miles per kilowatt hour, and a kilowatt hour today is about 20 cents. So it costs you about seven cents per mile today for an electric car. So that's that's one thing. Okay, In, that's good. Ed, and do you want to pause and see if Jim wants to uh, jump at that one? Sure. Well, yeah, there's a lot of variation in the efficiency of each electric car so I think i'm just using our average average values that that the car companies publish um the second thing about uh, changing all of our heating systems from gas for example to electric um today a a uh, therm of 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 natural gas cost about a buck 30 delivered, not to get the cost of the gas itself, but delivered because in fact, most of the cost is from the transportation of the gas. And a, the, the equivalent amount of electricity is about 30 kilowatt hours, which is over $6. So most of these uh, high efficiency heat pumps 
have a factor of about three improvement, but to go, you have to go from $6 and change down to about $2, you're still 50% higher than what people are paying for gas. So right. all good, that, good points, good points. Um, we, I'm sorry, one, did, one, did you one, have one, Yeah, one, one last answer. point, one, one yeah. last point. Electric cars are great, but today batteries are manufactured with materials that have been mined in a very unenvironmental manner. And so you really need to consider the entire life cycle of what you're buying and not just what someone is selling you at a supermarket or a car store or something like that. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lester. Thank you so much for bringing these up. And before the uh, panel goes at them, I'll, I'll just want to say to the audience that Lester's raising excellent questions that all energy experts have been uh, grappling with and wrestling with for uh, the last three or four years, as this pathway has been emerging and continue to be grappling with because they're made. They lead to major policy questions, and and I'm going to say something flip. And I apologize not to diminish or uh, anything that you're saying, Lester, because they're important things. But remember, cycle back to 1903, the the scary new car. Um, there are these are valid concerns. These are valid concerns, but there were very valid concerns with new cars. Um, somehow we, I'm not saying it was all good. We probably had lost some stuff when we lost uh, 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 animal uh, drayage or animal conveyance. Um, but um, I'll shut up now and let the panel go after uh, these questions. These are excellent. Jim, you're nodding. Penny, are you ready after that? <laughs> go for it. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and uh, Jim probably, uh, Jim Redden probably has some comments on this as well. Um, yeah, cobalt is one of the main um, uh, materials that goes into batteries. A lot of that comes, I believe, from the Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, and the the environmental uh, impacts there and the quite frankly the social impacts uh, and the exploitation of the workers is terrible there absolutely um, Tesla is working on a battery that will dramatically reduce the amount of co cobalt if not eliminate it um, there's also big cobalt um, uh, deposits in Idaho that uh, mining companies are beginning to take a look at. So uh, hopefully a lot of those problems will uh, be minimized in, in the future. Um, as far as the cost of heat pumps, um, yes, you're right. Uh, you know, in pure dollar uh, forms, there is a, a big discrepancy. Um, gas prices have gone up a lot this year. We'll see what happens in future years. They are likely to continue to go up. And if the price itself doesn't go up, I believe at some point there will be a carbon tax imposed uh, on fossil fuels uh, to address that as well. Because um, not only do you have the emissions when that gas reaches your house and you burn it, um, leaks along the pipe, well, everywhere from the well to when it enters your house, there's a lot of leakage. And methane is uh, anywhere from 28 to 80% more powerful uh, greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, depending on what time frame you look at. So um, the financial cost might be a little bit lower, but the climate cost is dramatically higher for continuing to use natural gas. Penny, thoughts? No, I think Jim nailed it. No pun intended. <laughs> Okay, does anybody else have anything they want to add to address the very good questions we've heard so far while you're thinking about that? Anybody in the audience would like to unmute themselves? Um, I think you have to request. Okay, in the meantime, we've got another question from Julia Getcha. Is it cheaper to use a heat pump or to turn, I'm, I'm sorry, is it cheaper to use a heat pump to heat your home on oil, I think it, it says. And uh, this was or my oil. situation. Or oil. Yeah. I, I heat, a okay, heat pump thank today. Thank you. Is, thank you. A heat pump. A heat pump today is cheaper than oil. Right. So this is my situation. Uh, 
took me a lot much longer than it should have but i finally did go to a ground source heat pump at, a, at our house 82 bridge street and uh, we have been this is our first winter with it and it's operating just fine we were oil before and we are definitely spending less money uh, now however we also have uh, come next summer we will have a new air conditioning system where we did not have an air conditioning system before all right so hopefully that addresses that quickly addresses that question Julia and so I will invite folks who are in the audience if they'd like to uh, become unmuted you got I think you have to text to say so or, or raise your hand you could raise your hand and maybe we could promote that way uh, um, could I just read out this question? I think it's from Jeanette Rule, and uh, she was asking, somebody had mentioned to her that they didn't make, see any sense in getting solar panels on their home if they can get 100% renewable electricity through the community aggregation. I think, um, I, I, did you? Oh, from community aggregation? Oh, well, yeah. I so think maybe, Penny addressed it be outside of community aggregation, right, Penny? Yes, uh, the the investing in solar panels is about investing and in saving uh, dollars for yourself because uh, they pay for themselves in seven years. As, as Jim said, it was about a 10% return, which is very lucrative. So uh, then securing the balance of your energy needs through 100% renewables, you can do that today by going on. Massachusetts has a great website. You can also get it through Eversource of competitive suppliers, and there's suppliers that will offer 100% renewable options. And certainly once we offer our Medfield community electricity, uh, you can uh, choose that 100% option for the balance. But really investing in solar panels, if your roof is viable, is about saving money for yourself. And I'll add one other uh, dimension to that. Because if your roof, uh, Jeanette, is viable for solar, um, then if you put solar on your roof, you're adding net new solar capacity to the system. And I think it's roughly 40% of homes, you know, have the right, you know, characteristics for solar, but 60% don't. So if you put solar on your house, you free up capacity at a solar farm that someone who can't do solar panels um, would then be able to, to buy. So more solar, less carbon. Can I just uh, jump in? Teresa James had another question about heat pumps. Um, about I think this relates to to the sub to, to the rebates that MassSave is now offering. I think Jim had uh, suggested that it's ten thousand dollars flat. Teresa said, I'm sure it varies based on size, but what is the range of cost for heat pumps? So I can't give you a general answer, but um, so the the $10,000 from all I know, from all I understand right now, it, it kicks in when you heat your whole home with uh, heat pumps and have no fossil fuel backup system. Um, it, if you do a partial replacement, then I think it's twelve hundred fifty dollars per ton. That's right. And uh, there's additional rebates that you can access to uh, have a, a sort of a control system that switches over from your from your heat pump to fossil fuel when the conditions are uh, preferable for that. Um, so um, you know the, the the question is like usually most people have like three to five ton whether that is competitive price-wise with getting the $10,000 flat for your home. Um, right, I wanted, I wanted to uh, challenge the audience. First of all, thank you so much for listening and thanks for all the great questions. And we're doing our best to address them expeditiously here. But my challenge for any of you, if you'd like to speak up or type in any responses about the plan. In other words, uh, all the dis all this discussion is great and it's exactly what's needed to move forward with the plan. But right now, what, uh, the, the, the explicit purpose for tonight's meeting was to preview, preview the town's climate action plan and look for feedback from uh, look for feedback on it. So 
now's a good time if anybody would like to make any comments would be appreciated and uh it, there's a little back and forth here about whether somebody did or didn't have their hand up to speak uh please put your hand up if you'd like oh, i see lester does and uh could somebody let lester in to speak again or you know Hi, can you hear me? Go for it. So, so um, by the way, I'm an engineer, um, and it's very important to be able to measure your progress. And what is what is the planning to measure the progress of the town, let's say every five years or something like that? Um, the, the second point is, and the last point is, Jim Nell, excuse me, nailed it on the head uh, when he talked about the, uh, not the monetary benefits of uh, changing over from gas to electric and all that stuff, but the, the life-threatening uh, events that will happen, no doubt about it, if we don't do it. And I think that needs to be stressed strongly, but not in a, uh, can't think of the right word. Um, not, not in the sense that will alarm or scare people. So I, I I appreciate that, Lester, and I think Haley will address your your good, very good question about how often we're going to be re, uh, um, looking at this. She she uses the term evergreen. That's great, uh, but I appreciate you saying uh, we want to do things in ways that don't scare people. I totally agree, and that's sort of the reason why my theme was new technology by itself can sometimes to some people in some ways seem scary. And part of our job is to diminish that, that, uh, that hurdle as much as possible. Hilly. Yeah, so thanks Lester for that question. Um, so in the short term, we will uh, just sort of measure, you know, the, the actions we do and uh, like how many webinars we put on and that sort of thing, but that's not measuring our progress. Of course, our progress can be measured in how many heat pumps have been installed in town, how many electric vehicles have been purchased or registered. And uh, we are working with the town assessor to get an annual update on that. Um, some of the data is really excellent, uh, especially in the housing sector. Uh, some of the data, especially in the car sector, is terrible and we are there are state initiatives to change the way RMV is uh, registering vehicles so that we can have access to that data more easily. Um, and in terms of doing a, a whole new inventory every now and then, that uh, goes back to how this inventory was done. We uh, are using uh, international standards for community inventories and we are reliant on publicly available data. And uh, we have been working on a platform that was created by the um, MAPC, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. And whenever they release a new version, our la latest bit data is from 2017, we will update our progress on the inventory. I hope that addresses your questions. And Kelly, if, if I may, I just uh, think you're not taking full credit for the great work of this uh, climate action plan. So what uh, all of you heard tonight were a list of initiatives that help us achieve these goals. And what Hilly has helped us do as we've developed this plan is that for each of those initiatives, we've identified metrics that tell us whether the initiatives are having an impact. So for example, we talked about homes and businesses installing solar. So one of the measures of success is we'll be measuring the number of homes and businesses that do install solar. This will help us evaluate whether our outreach is effective. We'll get feedback from citizens about what worked, what didn't, what are the barriers, so that we can continue to enhance and accelerate the adoption. So uh, there are a lot of metrics associated if you drill down with each one of these initiatives. All right, I'm seeing I'm looking to see further questions. Not seeing any and by, by the way, Bob Winograd, I, I owe an, uh, an apology to he put in uh, four different questions. And Bob, if you feel strongly, uh, please raise your hand that we address any of them now. 
Bob is also on the Medfield Energy Committee, so he's not being cheated if he doesn't get his questions answered here in this form. Um, so, so I do have one last question that I see here from Jeanette Rule, and uh, she asks, when is the community aggregation Medfield community electricity um, going to begin? And I think that is sort of out of our hands now and start, uh, Megan can talk to that. Hi, yes, we are in a process where we're just about ready to go to the Department of Public Utilities for their review of our plan. And that process will probably last nine to 12 months. So our community aggregation program won't begin in Medfield, I would say, for until next winter. But we're on our way, but it's a long process. Great. All right. Uh, I will ask one more time. Oh, Lester, do you still have, do you have your hand up anew, or is that the old hand up? I, I'm inviting anybody else to put their hand up if they'd like. And Lester took his hand down. Thank you, Lester. Okay, you did have great questions, Lester. Really appreciate it. Everyone's uh, questions were really appreciated. And please keep them coming. The Energy Committee works on this stuff all the time. And uh, this work that we outlined tonight will be continued for the next two months uh, intensively. So as Hilly said, if you didn't get your input in tonight or have f further feedback after tonight, please provide it um, any way you want, but specifically there will be a, a public uh, comment period uh, that will be announced, correct, Hilly? Yes, yes, We're, we will uh, publish a, a written draft of the TOMCAP and open a public comment period in February. Good, and I'll just make a pitch too, if you would like to be more engaged with our group, um, of course, we love your engagement here. But the Energy Committee meets on the second Tuesday, no, second Thursday of every month. And also, um, Hilly is gathering an email list. And if you would like to join that email list, you can send an email to tomcap at medfield.net. I again thank the panelists. I thank Sarah and Pete for coming out and addressing us tonight. Uh, I thank all the attendees uh, very much, and uh, I hope we'll, you'll be engaged going forward. And I think with that, we can close the meeting. Uh, I motion to close the Energy Committee meeting. There's a second. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.